Thank you guys all so much for being here. Uh, Kusha and I are really excited to give this presentation for you, are, for you all. So this is Kusha, I'm Kyle. Uh, we are both fourth year data science majors. We have both done research with HGSI, which we'll talk about a little later, and we've both done a few data science internships over the past few years. So we're here to answer any questions that you guys have. Um, we'll save some time for the end, but today we're just gonna be talking mostly about NLP, natural language processing. All right, so let's get right into it. We're gonna start off with this meme right here. I mean, at first, I mean, take a look at it. You might not understand it, but hopefully at the end of this presentation, you'll see how relevant this meme is. Um, so kind of going over what we're gonna go through today, we're gonna start out with asking what is natural language processing, um, go through some numerical rep representations of language, some unsupervised techniques, and then some supervised techniques. All right, so before we get into it, I want to ask you guys, what is NLP? Can someone tell me what NLP is? Any brave souls out there? Don't be shy. You. Nice. What's NLP? Uh, In your own words, if you know. No worries. It's basically a way of taking in um, framed English and like speech and then um, processing it to a format where a computer can run operations. Oh my gosh. Well, Every round of applause. Round of applause. Wow. That's brilliant. Um, so we found a really good definition on IBM's website. Um, I'm gonna read through it quick. It says, natural language processing, or NLP, refers to the branch of computer science, and more specifically, the branch of artificial intelligence, or AI, concerned with giving computers the ability to understand text and spoken words in much the same way human beings can. So you were pretty much spot on. I wanna add one thing to your definition. You said English, obviously it can be any language, um, and there's also a lot of natural language processors that are designed for like hundreds of languages. So not, not limited to just English. All right, our next question is, what are some applications of NLP that you've seen? Any examples, yeah. Alexa. Alexa. Siri. Siri. Like all those types of stuff, that was like the next just like the general like HTML stuff. Yeah, of course. Google Translate, yeah, that's, that's yeah. great. Those are great examples. Um, yeah, so we have some examples right here. Sentiment analysis, search engines, recommender systems with text, language translation, and so many more. Um, and you can kind of look at this visualization here. It shows where NLP kind of falls within the AI, ML, deep learning landscape. Um, so it kind of dips into all three of those sectors. Um, yeah. All right, so if you're working on any sort of NLP project, um, the first step you have to take is data pre-processing. Um, and if you look at like any, if you look at a book, for example, you'll see there's things like punctuation, um, or like an essay will have like extra spaces, there's stop words like the, but, is, et cetera. Um, here's an example right here, like hey bro, with three exclamation points. Um, if you feed that into your model, I, who knows that your model's had like, or it's seen three exclamation points, right? So you're gonna wanna clean that up to hey bro, um, and then you want over stop words. There's this thing called lemmatizing text, so if you wanna kinda condense words like running or runs to run, that might be beneficial to your model. Um, so you'll see in any NLP project you work, this is like your first step. Um, yeah. A couple of things, oh, oh no. Ooh, no. Oh. Um, a couple things I want to add. Uh, some of these steps aren't always necessary depending on your application. Like if you're cleaning tweets, sometimes you care if someone's typing in all caps. Sometimes you care if someone puts 19 exclamation points at the end of their tweet um, because it can be meaningful about the sentiment of the tweet. Um, and again, with softwares, usually you want to delete them, but sometimes you have natural language processors that are actually looking at words by part of speech. Like they want to know the adjective, the adverb, the noun, the proposition. And in that situation, you might not want to remove stop words. But typically, for most applications, you only want the important words. You don't care if someone's saying running or runs. You know that means that someone is going somewhere really fast, and that's all you care about. And one of the first things we want to dive into is a topic called TF-IDF, which stands for Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency. It's basically a statistical measure that is able to convert a sentence into a vector. Um, that a computer can then parse and turn into whatever uh, way you want it to. And the main applications for using TF-IDF are machine learning, information retrieval, and text summarization. Um, so basically how it works is you're gonna have, uh, like you can have three documents, for example, right here, and a bunch of words within each of those documents or sentences. 
And then your model has this, or not your model, your, uh, the equation is right here. It's term frequency, which is how many times a word is in each document times the inverse document frequency, which is the number of total documents over the number of documents containing that word. So essentially gives each word a weight relative to that document. So you can see like which words are uh, impactful in seeing uh, where they can be found. So like you can see, um, here's a good example. So like going right here, I guess zero, it's either used in every uh, document here, so which means it's not really necessary. It's not necessarily important. Whereas today is used in these, so it has weight here. So it's, it's essentially some way to, like you said, convert text into a vector which you can use. Yeah. And this is kind of a weird case that it and is have high TF-IDF values because in most, if you're comparing like novels or books, like it and is is going to be in every single book. So it's probably not that important, but what TF-IDF is really trying to do is find the words that are in document A but are not in any of the other documents. Not that absolute, but you, wanna, you don't care about the word the. The word the is in everything. But you might care about the word rain because the, rain, the word rain is not going to be in every document of text that you find. And that's what TF-IDF does. Cool. Um, one of our favorite applications of NLP here, something that Kusha and I have both worked a lot with, is sentiment analysis. So, like you would expect, you guys have all heard of this phrase before, sentiment analysis is the process of detecting negative or positive sentiment in text. Um, it is used heavily in industry for a lot of different things, like customer reviews. You go on Amazon, all of that is going through an NLP engine when you're looking at the review section. They want to know how a product is really doing, customer complaints, um, any kind of social media, ah, any kind of social media, come on any kind of social media like brand reputation, you're always wanting to do NLP on that. Um, so we're gonna go through, a f come on. We're gonna go through a few examples. I think it's this. Oh yeah. Oh, it's totally that. Ooh, it's, it's like okay, whatever, here. whatever, don't touch the thing. Um, cool, first example, easy one. I really enjoyed that movie, it was very funny. What do you guys think, thumbs up, thumbs down, positive, negative, thumbs up, easy one. How about, that was not the greatest meal I've ever had. Oh, that shouldn't be. Probably, probably thumbs down. Sometimes a, a good algorithm can detect an easy single negative like that. But if you say, I am not mad about something, that's when it gets a little dicey. Or, or I am never not going to this workshop again. It was so good. You know, it's, it can get more complicated like that. And say you have something like, I'm going for a walk. What do you guys think? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways. Thumb sideways, it's a neutral sentiment. Um, and we'll go into this one, wow dude, congrats, you're so cool, do you want a trophy? We'll get to it, what do you guys think though? Thumbs up, <laughs> thumbs down, thumbs sideways, what do you think a computer's guessing? Yeah. We'll see, we'll see. Um, cool, so this is the kind of state of the art, I would say, this is Roberta, um, which is made by Hugging Face, it's the sentiment analysis that is most commonly used in industry. Um, this summer, I interned at JP Morgan on their AI research team. They used Hugging Face, they used Roberta a lot. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But for example, this easy, this easy one, I really enjoyed that movie, it was funny. Label zero is negative, label one is neutral, label two is positive. It got this as 99% positive. Pretty easy one. Little more complicated, there's a negative in here. That was not the greatest meal I've ever had. It still got it, label zero is negative, 89% confidence, not as good as this first one, but not bad. I am going for a walk, eh, not, not, not negative, um, it knew that, 27% positive, that kind of makes sense, and 72% neutral. So this state-of-the-art alg algorithm is really good, we'll talk a little bit more about it later. Um, for this fourth example, wow dude, congrats, you're so cool. Um, we were actually surprised, it did a really good job on this, it got 99% negative. Um, so I'm sure they are doing something, um, this algorithm is created by Google, they are doing something in there to try to identify um, sarcasm uh, in text. Um, so you can go beyond just good, bad, neutral with sentiment analysis. Um, there's a lot of different domains that you can apply it to. Uh, we're going to talk shortly about finance and politics. So this summer while I was at the AI research team at JP Morgan, one of the big projects we were doing was called Tweet FinCEN. And essentially what the team was doing there is they were trying to have an NLP algorithm that could look at a tweet, Tesla long, uh, SoFi, not touching it, I love the company though we all know the rules and what happens during the lockup, stuff like that. 
Um, they might have some traditional sentiment, but if you're a financial company, you don't care about the traditional sentiment. You care about whether this tweet is indicating that the stock might go up or might go down. So for example, Tesla long, that means hold it for the long time, keep it in your wallet, don't sell. The traditional sentiment, negative or neutral, but the stock sentiment here is definitely positive. The person who tweeted this wants people to keep buying Tesla. Don't sell your Tesla. Um, for example, buy the effing dip, hold the line. When you see this curse word and you see people yelling, exclamation points, the traditional sentiment here is definitely negative. But what you're actually saying here is keep buying GameStop, AMC, Nokia, whatever. The stock sentiment here is definitely positive. Um, and so that was something I worked on this summer. Something that Kush and I were doing with HGSI last year is we were creating an algorithm that would be able to tell left-leaning or right-leaning political bias. Um, and this was something that we spent a year on. It was definitely not an easy project. We were only focusing on Twitter data, um, but for example, this one right here, Pelosi and Hillary, or should I say Killary, should both be behind bars. Hashtag crooked Hillary. If you tweet something like that, a normal sentiment analysis would say this is definitely negative. You're saying kill, you're saying behind bars. The computer immediately sees that that's a negative tweet. But when you're actually like, that, that doesn't really mean anything for the political side of it. The political, the political side is obviously right-leaning because they're talking about these two Democrats and they're saying they should be behind bars. So our algorithm could see that this was a right-leaning tweet with 92% confidence, um, although it is negative with 81% confidence. Um, getting a little bit into how the computer actually takes this text and converts it into numbers or data that the computer can process. So we talked a little bit about TFIDF. That's one method. That's typically the baseline, I would say, is TFIDF, or the real baseline is bag of words. Um, and a good example of when you might use a bag of words model for something simple is ham or spam detection. If you're Gmail and you want to know when is an email spam and when is it something that the person actually wants to see, um, it's really easy to make the mistake of marking something not spam as spam, and then the person doesn't see an email that might have been really important to them. So you have to be careful not to make that error. Um, but what you might do with a bag of words, a very simple model, is just one hot encodes popular words. You have 100 emails and you have these keywords. For example, attention in all caps. That might be, oh, I see that they're really trying to get the person's attention. It's not definitely spam, but it's more likely to be spam when it contains that in all caps. Or you see something like, the Prince of Nigeria needs you to donate $100 million. As we know from the office, that's likely not real. It could be, but it's likely not real and it's a sign that we might not believe that and we might see it as spam. Um, moving forward, uh, usually you don't just want to look at each individual word. You don't want to see, I love data science student society. Those are the unigrams. You can also look at the bigram pairs. I love, love data, data science, or the trigram pairs. I love data, love data science, data science student. Um, can often be much more helpful than just looking at each word one at a time, or people don't really do this, but sometimes each letter once at a time, you don't really get as much information as you need. Um, so one main method that people use to get text to data is a word embedding. So say we have all of these words in our sentence or document, no stop, about that. Um, so say we have all of these observations here in a text and we want to create features out of these observations. One strategy that people often use is trying to categorize each word. For example, let's look at cat. We can put it into these seven different categories of living, be living being, feline, human, gender, royalty, verb, plural. These are kind of arbitrary. You can pick whatever categories you want. Um, but once you kind of rate these, like a cat is a living being. It's not human, so it doesn't get a score of one, but it gets 0.6. A cat's definitely a feline, gets a score of 0.9. It could even be one. I feel like it's a pretty perfect one. Yeah. Um, and you can kind of just see how that works. Um, so. Word embeddings are usually pretty high dimensional because you want to have all these different categories that you base it off of. Um, and what you're going to go on to do after creating these word embeddings once you have this matrix is you're going to do some dimensionality reduction, which we're going to continue to talk about on the next slide. Where am I? So dimensionality reduction is a really important concept in data science. Um, essentially, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's the transformation of data from a high dimensional space, say seven columns, into a lower dimensional space, say two columns. But you can really do it from any number to any smaller number. Um, for example, we're working on a project for our senior project right now. The data has 830 columns. It's super fun, not really. Um, but that's, that's what you're working with a lot of the time in data science. So there's a lot of reasons that you might do dimensionality reduction. First of all, if we're trying to run a 
neural network on 800 columns, it is going to take a long, long time. So that's not something you typically want to do. Maybe a neural network wasn't the best example because it's actually good with large data sets. But if you're running any kind of model that's time intensive and you have 800 columns and you have a million observations, it's going to take a long time. Um, furthermore, oftentimes you're going to have highly linear, high, highly dependent columns. Um, for example, in our 800 column data set, some of the examples of features are how many times has this person gone delinquent on their credit bill in the past month, in the past six months, in the past 12 months. Yeah. Obviously, those columns are not exactly the same, but pretty similar. Um, and you can condense that data. So some of the main algorithms for dimensionality reduction are PCA, principal component analysis, SVD, singular value decomposition, T, stochastic neighbor embeddings, I've never used that, and there's many more that you can use. Um, and this is often a pre-processing step when you're creating a model or doing any kind of data visualization. So the most, most commonly used algorithm is PCA, principal component analysis. And essentially what this does is it learns a transformation for the data, moving it from N fe M features to N features, um, let's say M features to K features, K principal components. And a, a big problem with PCA and dimensionality reduction in general is you don't know exactly how it goes from seven features to two or from 800 features to 50. You kind of just got to trust it. There is a way to figure it out, but it's, it gets pretty complicated because essentially what PCA does is it takes, say, these 800 columns and it creates linear combinations of each column such that you are left with just K features. And the goal, sorry, that was kind of a confusing explanation. The goal of PCA is to maximize the variance while fitting it into 10 features. So you still want to be able to see all of the differences in the data, all of the variation between observations, but you have to do it in a way that minimizes the feature space. Um, the actual way that it's done is very linear algebra heavy. Um, it goes down to eigenvectors and eigenvalues, if any of you have taken Math 18 or beyond. I don't understand exactly how it works. I use sklearn and it works and I trust it. That's all you really need to do. Um, you can go deeper into the theory of it if you're interested. Most jobs will not require you to. Um, there are certain cases that they might want to say, oh, you're deciding based on principal component four, what is principal component four? And that's the time that you kind of have to go into it deeper and see what was the linear combination that created that component. Um, most, of, most of the time, if you're doing dimensionality reduction, PCA, you can kind of just do it. You say, it works. I don't know exactly how it works, but it works. Yeah, and just to add on that, you have to be careful as well with PCA. Sometimes you lose valuable information um, because you're totally. losing your features. So that's something important to know. Yeah, a typical metric for PCA is, say you go from 10 columns down to 9. A typical metric is what uh, proportion of the variance was preserved when you did that. So what variation in the data can you still see? When you go from 10 columns to 9, it might be... 88%. When you go from 10 columns to 2, it might be 37% of the data that you're still um, keeping separate. Cool. Um, and then I want to go back up for a sec before I talk about clustering. So once you are able to go from the seven dimensions to the two dimensions, two dimensions is a pretty common target for PCA because two or three dimensions is something that we can graph and visualize. When you get up to four dimensions, visualizing becomes really complicated. You don't want to do it as a data scientist. The people that you're working for don't care what it looks like. Two dimensions is much easier to visualize. So you'll kind of see in this example, it can still tell that cat and kitten are very similar. Dog is kind of similar, and house is way up here. Man and woman, um, it's actually pretty cool, this man and woman, king, queen example. You can kind of see it still preserves the differences between them, which is what PCA aims to do. Um, and yeah, so once you have this PCA done, you have your data in a two-dimensional space, you might want to do some clustering on it so you can find similar words, like cat and kitten might be in this cluster, man and woman might be in this cluster, um, and houses might be in this cluster, for example. It depends on how the PCA works. Um, but for those that don't know, clustering is an unsupervised machine learning task, which means you don't have to label the data yourself. The computer can figure it out without having labeled data. Um, and yeah, essentially it separates input vectors into certain groups or clusters. You can set the number of clusters uh, for most clustering algorithms. But for the most part, you feed the, you feed the algorithm data and it'll spit out your clusters. It's, it's a really cool um, ML method. All right, now the fun stuff. We're gonna go into some NLP libraries. Um, so one of the, the main uh, and most prominent, prominent uh, NLP libraries, NLTK, 
Raise your hand if you've used NLTK before. Anyone? One, two, okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's very good, very simple. They have a lot of documentation. And if you're willing to get into NLP, I think one of the first libraries you should take a look at is NLTK. Um, and it, it's all open source as well. Um, Spacey as well, and Genzim. Um, those are two other uh, popular NLP libraries. I personally haven't worked with them. Um, I mainly just use NLTK. It's gotten the job done for me. Um, but sometimes when you're doing a, like a sentiment analysis, for example, it's, it could be of use to try out these different libraries and see which one would work better on your data set. Um, uh, oftentimes, NLTK and Spacey are used for pre-processing. If you want to turn running into run, if you want to get rid of your punctuation, your capitalization, NLTK and Spacey make that super easy for you. Um, and raise your hand if you're familiar with uh, Scikit-Learn or SKLearn. Anyone? All right. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> um, so SKLearn, it's a very powerful machine learning library for all skill levels. Um, again, very good documentation, easy to implement, has pretty much everything you can think of when it comes to ML. Um, I'd highly recommend if you're getting started in ML, you look at their documentation, mess around with SKLearn. Um, great resource, great resource. and Throughout your data science curriculum, if most of you are data science majors, you'll be using it all the time. Um, and in any jobs or internships you go into related to machine learning. But now, the real fun stuff, transformers. So what is a transformer? Personally, I couldn't tell you how a transformer works. They're very, very complicated things, okay? Um, they are a new type of ML or model heavily used for NLP tasks. Uh, they basically compute an entire input simultaneously to speed up prediction. They use this thing called multi-headed self-attention with word embeddings to con contextualize them. Very complicated. I don't understand it. I'm having trouble reading the slides. Um, and let's move on to the next slide. Yeah. Um, one more thing I just want to add. When, when we were showing you that example earlier, that hugging face Roberta algorithm, that's a transformer, mm -hmm. um, which I think we'll get into more. When I was interning this summer, everything that they did for NLP was using transformers, was using Roberta or some other kind of transformer. Speaking of Roberta, there you here's go. Our, sign on, or our slide on Roberta. Um, so BERT stands for Bidirectional Representation Transformer. Um, again, as Kyle explained earlier, it's made by Google, and it's probably the most powerful and uh, popular NLP model in the industry. I guess you can compare like GTP3 to it. GTP. Yeah, sorry. Um, but yeah, Kyle and I used uh, the Roberta uh, model for our research, and it, the one we used was pre-trained on like 70 million tweets. Um, so you can think about how powerful that could be, right? Um, and I put a link to a, a cool YouTube video that kind of goes into some of the use cases. But basically, anything from, uh, if you go on Google basically and search anything, and have you seen somehow it's like, sometimes it's a summary of like the most promising like article, the like most important one? That's Roberta, or Bert, whatever. You click it, you know sometimes it highlights important parts of an article? That's Bert. Like every step of a Google search, from like recommendations to um, like all aspects are using this incredible model. Um, and this, I think this is another, if you click that link to, um, we'll release, release the slides later. Um, on Hugging Face's website, um, yeah, so you can, it's kind of like a, uh, a prediction of what's the next word going to be, kind of like when you're on your iPhone, you're sending a text, you know, you like click the, what's going to be next. So, I need to see, and it's saying with 32, with 30% 30 probability it's going to be him, 28% probability it thinks it's going to be her. Um, and these are, again, pre-trained models on millions and millions of um, sentences, so... And you can see here, data sets used to train, so Wikipedia, Book Corpus, um, yeah. And... Cool, so this is a very, very fun meme I found. So, it's like the Winnie the Pooh. Basic Winnie the Pooh is like Transformers movie, but classy Winnie the Pooh likes Transformers, the real Transformers. Um, yeah, so. Once, once again, like, this is really how a transformer works. It is super complicated. If you feel like you can figure it out and you can have a really good understanding of them, then you should go work at Google. But they are, like, 
really difficult. They're, they're not impossible to get a basic understanding of, um, but for the most part, you don't need to understand it to use it, and that is one of the beautiful things about data science. Um, and here's another meme I found. It's like when you penalize your natural language generator model for large sentence lengths, you know, Kevin from the office, when you <laughs> stop using stop words, what do you think when it is? Um, these are some, also some good uh, sources if you're interested. I think this guy, um, this is the, the video I tagged. I think it's the same guy. Um, he explained the BERT model. Um, so definitely check it out if you're interested. He said and, all these slides are on the website. Yeah, they should be uploaded. Um, yeah. So that's pretty, mu pretty much wraps it up. Um, thank you guys for being here. And we're going to open the floor to any questions you all have. We have... 15 minutes. Oh, we, have we don't have to fill the time, but. Any questions? Yeah. How did you get started learning like NLP and doing like NLP research? So we started, so we applied for, we wanted to apply to do HCSI research. I would recommend all you guys do that. It's a year long project. Um, it's, it's honestly about as intensive as you want. You do need to ask a faculty to sponsor us. So we had Justin Eldridge, if any of you guys know him. He is the absolute best. He's awesome. He's probably going to be your DSC 80 teacher. Um, yeah, so we, we just decided that we wanted to do research, and we just said, where should we start? And it was right at the start of COVID when there was all this misinformation going around on Twitter um, about, about the virus, about how it spreads. People had no idea what they were talking about. So we started with planning on trying to do a misinformation and political bias algorithm, uh, detection algorithm. Um, which we found was going to be super, super difficult, and we kind of just took on too big of a scope for that project, so we decided just to focus on detecting political bias in tweets. Um, and yeah, from there, I was, I've was i talked about that project that we did, detecting political, political bias, in many interviews. Um, if you can really explain a project like that and know what you're talking about, your interviewer will be impressed. They honestly care much more about you being able to explain a project you did, how you did it, what data you got, how you got it, and be able to justify all those choices, they care much more about that than a 4.0, more often than not. Yeah, also to add on to that, I guess um, going into that project, we didn't have much NLP experience. You do learn a little bit in DSC-80, right? Yeah, you learn a good amount in yeah. 80, but that um, was before we took That was 80. before we took the class, so we really, even machine learning, we were like kind of clueless, mm -hmm. but... Um, the beauty of doing a project is you kind of fail and learn. So we, we, we were lucky enough to get, like, you get paid for the scholarship project. Um, so it's, fi it's 500 bucks a quarter for four quarters. Yeah. That includes summer. And you're learning, and it's, it's perfect for your resume. Um, but even if you don't apply for that or get that, any sort of project you work on, you can just start researching articles, watching YouTube videos, kind of get your, your feet wet in the NLP world, and then it all kind of starts flowing, you know? Um, and then you start seeing it in your courses, and you're like, hey, I know how to do this, right? Um, so, yeah. yeah. And it, it definitely varies from job to job, but I've heard from a lot of interviewers, or like in some inter informational interviews, um, they will say, I don't care what school you went to, I don't care what courses you took, I care about your projects, I care about what your GitHub looks like, and I care that you're able to explain it. Yeah, I want to go up to that meme again, see if it makes sense now. <laughs> Here we go. This is kind of what Kyle was saying, how he doesn't really understand how BERT works, but... But I um, know it works. You know it works. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yeah. So, so based on that, would you recommend um, like starting projects early, even if you haven't built any like, you know, projects or get like, any of those? 100%, 100%. Even like, um, I don't know what year, what year, are you guys, raise your hand if you're a first year. Okay, second year. Third and fourth, cool. Yeah, um, <laughs> I remember my first year. I did a project on. Uh, I, I like playing FIFA, the soccer game. So I was like, um, what if we could use like FIFA player rankings to predict like how the final standings would be in the next year of the Premier League? Um, and I had no idea how to do it. Like zero clue. I didn't know how to do pandas. I didn't know machine learning. Um, but I just watched YouTube videos, read articles. I did it over summer too. So if you don't get an internship, like your first or second year, or third year even, I'd highly recommend working on a project or two. Um, and that's honestly, if you do a really developed project and spend enough time on it and learn enough, it's as important as an internship, I think. Yeah. 
as relevant as that. So definitely, when you have the time, get started on some, whatever you're interested in, you know? Like, what are you interested in? Like, data science, you can apply it so many ways, right? You can do sports, you can do climate change, you can do... Uh, one, one thing I want to add, if you guys really don't know where to start, like, you know you want to do a project, but you don't know how to do it, go to Kaggle and look at their data sets. Kaggle has hundreds of thousands of data sets with so, like, huge, complete data sets that are really helpful if you don't know where to start a project. Um, also, one more thing I just want to talk about, like, there are a ton of people that are data scientists that never got a college degree. They will do boot camps, or maybe they, they get a college degree, but maybe it's in math, or maybe it's in CS, and they become data scientists. Like, there is so much that you're able to teach yourself from going on Google and trying to, if you're like, oh, I have no idea what PCA is, watch a YouTube video for five minutes, go on SK Learn's website and spend 10 minutes reading over the documentation. Even if you don't completely get it, you will probably figure out how to use it, when to use it, and it's so helpful. There's so much data science that you can learn on your own, not in DSC 80, not in a really difficult class. Not that those classes are helpful, they're super helpful, but there's so much that you can learn on your own just browsing the web. Yeah? It's slightly more technical, but for some of the tools you mentioned, like Bert, do they work just as well with other languages that are not English? I wouldn't say just as well, and the reason why is that there's not as much training data. Um, like when, when we're looking at that Roberta Twitter sentiment analysis, that thing that had what, 70 million tweets and I would say 60 million are English, I don't know, I'm pulling that out of nowhere, but a bunch of them are English. So it kind of just depends on how much training data you have, like there could be a fantastic model um, that is in the Spanish language, but it, it could have the exact same architecture as BERT, but if it only has 5 million training samples, it won't be quite as good, but the, the technology exists, and it's kind of just a question of training the model with up to 70 million tweets. Yeah, if you're interested, go on Hugging Face's website, and you can browse through some of their cool models, their BERT models as well. And we found one the other day that we'd never seen, and it was like multi-language, um, I don't know, sen was it sentiment? Some, XML something? sentiment, something yeah, like something that. Yeah, something crazy like that. Um, the thing is, it did take a really long time to run. Yeah, they're slow, um, they're slow. But... Yeah, um, check it out. One more thing to add to that. On that project I was talking about that I did this summer, the tweet FinCent, um, my team was doing everything that we were doing was with English tweets. There was another team that was working on all Chinese tweets, and we used a culmination of both of those models in our final model that went to production. So um, it definitely exists. That just It's easiest to use English because it's, at least for me, it's my native language. Um, and there's the most training data. The most training samples are in English. Other questions? Yeah, like 10 more minutes. Yeah. Which skill do you recommend like learning before learning uh, English? Skills. Um, I would say definitely be familiar with GitHub and version control. Um, beyond like Python, Java, R, SQL is a little more complicated. It's something you'll learn your third year if you haven't been exposed to it already. A lot of internships are looking for SQL. I would say most data science internships are looking for your Python knowledge. Um, Pandas is a really important library that you'll use almost everywhere. Um, no matter, on, honestly, almost no matter what you're doing. Um, what else are some skills? AWS is a good one to understand. Um, for your first internship, you might have to use it, you might not, depends on what kind of work you're doing. Yeah, um, also version like, control is a big one though. Yeah, data structures and algorithms, like the stuff you're learning in classes right now, I'd assume. Um, and if you've heard of leak code, um, I would totally, yeah, you guys are laughing in the back. <laughs> um, honestly, like, you can go once a day, just work on one leak code problem, and then try it. If you get it, cool. If you don't, learn how to do it. If you do it once a day, like, for a whole year, like, you're going to be a leak code master, you know? That's, like, very minimal effort. And you could answer any interview question, right? Um, so that's what I would say. One thing I'll also add, this doesn't really answer your question, but just in general, um, we've been through the internship application process twice. We're fourth years now looking for full-time jobs. You need to apply to as many internships as possible. My sophomore year, I applied to 100. My junior year, I applied to 60. Yeah, do, do 10 a day. Do five a day for three weeks, and you're at 100. Um, so many of them will be LinkedIn Easy Apply. It takes five buttons. Um, I just learned about a web, an app, a Google Chrome extension called Simplify that will autofill your resume into websites and actually do it accurately, unlike the resume parsers on Workday, which are not accurate and are really annoying. Um, 
But in general, it's a numbers game. If you apply to 100 companies, odds are three, four of them will give you interviews, and hopefully you'll nail one of those interviews. Yeah. Um, also, it's a numbers game. One more thing. I Make sure you use your connections and your network. Um, if you guys don't have LinkedIn, I highly recommend making a LinkedIn account. Just connecting with anyone that's relevant to you, like UCSD Data Science. Anytime I see a recommended person that's like UCSD Data Science, I automatically connect. Do I know them? No. But who knows what's going to happen. Like an example is I connected with this girl. Her name was Stephanie Moore. She was like a fourth year when I was a second year. Um, did I know her? I had no clue who she was. And then one day she LinkedIn messaged me and said, hey, are you looking for um, an internship? And I was like, yeah. She's like, we're looking for interns. Do you want to interview? Next thing you know, I interview and I get an internship at her, her um, I think she was like, she was like the lead intern at a, uh, an internship. So um, and then, it's as simple as that, you know. And then two months later, he got me an internship yeah, so at the same too. company. Oh my yeah, God, yeah. connections, crazy. Yeah. Um, talk to your friends, see if they can help you, especially at smaller, like this was like an eight person startup. It was like a data science podcast company that we, that, that, was, that was both of our first internships. And like, we didn't get a lot of technical skills out of it, but we definitely got some soft skills. And just to have data science intern on your resume makes a huge difference. Yeah, it doesn't have to be like Netflix, Google, Amazon. No, start, you know? everyone like, you starts somewhere. Dream. I don't even want to work there, so, yeah. Um, do you have a question? Uh, what is the timeline for, like, a mining uh, I usually start in October. Yeah, I'd start in October. Now. Start now. Um, August. Man, yeah, yeah August. The center of, I mean, now is, like, the worst time because of the, I don't know if you guys have heard, like, the job market right now. It's not good. It's rough for the fourth years out here when you're full-time. Other than our jobs. I mean, you're full-time as well, secure. I'm still looking. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you apply now and earlier, and I guess to like December. I mean, don't stop applying. Don't stop until you get an offer. Yeah, but they're all for next summer, typically. Is that also like to say something that, like something we will learn in the future, like your fourth summer and all that? Um, I, that's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> I've done it. I've done it, but I will not endorse it. It is risky. Yeah. yeah. I would just, if you're in a class right now, that's, like, let's say you just started DSC 20 and you're learning, or DSC 30 and you're doing Java, and you just started a class, I would put Java on my own. Because I'm going to learn it by the time, like, yeah. they get back to me, you know? Um, or, like, I don't know. I took like, an online class about SQL. I put SQL on my resume. I was like, if I get this job, I'll, like, learn more SQL, you know? Uh, which is it's not the best way, but it gets the job done. I've, I've said in interviews, like, I wouldn't necessarily have a skill on my resume, but they'll say, are you, maybe like my sophomore year, they would say, are you familiar with AWS and cloud computing? And I would say, currently I'm not, but next quarter I'll be taking a class on cloud computing, so I'll be much more proficient, and I'll be ready by the time the job starts. Yeah. That's something that's okay to say, and employers will not be upset about that at all. Yeah. And, like, take, like, online courses if you're interested. Like, you want to learn Pandas, take a Pandas. Kaggle is a cool Pandas course. I'd highly recommend it. Java, Code Academy, um, SQL, Code Academy as well. They're all free. I would, I would also say with internships, like, if you have never had a job before, or like me coming in to looking for data science internships, my resume said summer camp counselor. That was all I had. So the first job that he, Kusha and I both took was like not a glorious data science job. It was like a small making minimum wage at a startup. Um, so like, if you have no experience on your resume and you see a job like data entry specialist that might not be glamorous, it's a good place to start. It's so much better than nothing. And if you start with data entry specialist, something like that, you might just be working on spreadsheets all summer. But next summer, it'll look so much better than if you have nothing. Yeah. We got time for one more question. When did you guys get that February of our sophomore year. I guess December of our sophomore year for him. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you can get something after your freshman year, summer, that would be awesome. Um, so I, I did that data science internship between my, like from February to May of my sophomore year. And then I used, I had that on my resume and I used that to get a research and development intern position at a biotech company in San Diego. I was not doing data science there at all. But once I had that on my resume, it was much easier to take into the next step. And the next summer, I got this J.P. Morgan data science internship, which was awesome. Yeah, and if you get this, if you don't 
I mean, you're gonna fail, right? And it happens to everyone. Like, if you don't get the internship you want, or even an internship, just do a pro do a project, do a personal project, make a personal website. Just show that you have the skills that are equivalent of an internship. If you don't get one in the summer, you know, highly, highly recommend doing a project over the summer. Oh uh, yeah, we got time. That's quick. What's your favorite? I personally um, would love to start my own company that's a fintech company. Um, I'm a business minor. I've always been really interested in the finance aspect of data science. I think it's really cool to, to some extent, apply new tools to a field that's been done the same way for 50 years. That's super interesting to me. Um, that was why Kusha and I both chose to do Pedal, the credit card company, as our senior project. Um, I would love to start my own company, be my own boss, and kind of be super passionate about the vision and the direction of the company. Yeah, I think I want to, I'm really interested in like, climate change and sustainability. Um, so in any way I could make some sort of big impact, whether it's like starting my own like, climate change company or um, like being in a, like a sustainability role at a big company that has a big impact, um, that's kind of what I'm interested in. Long term, I don't know if I can do that in Java, the job market. We got two more minutes. Any last minute questions? Yeah. Uh, can you say a little bit more about your uh, internship with Jeffy Moore? Yeah, so there were a few different projects I was working on. So it was pretty interesting for me. I was on a weird team. It was the AI research team, which was just about 100 people in like a company with thousands of people. Um, so there were a few projects I was working on. One thing was the tweet FinCent that I was talking about. Um, another thing that I was working on for like six weeks, they, they did a really cool um, intern case study uh, challenge. And that was, I want to say, 25 teams of four. And they selected four, yeah, 25 teams of four, like 100 total interns um, in the AI research. And I think it was just beyond AI research. It was the entire AI and data science analyst program. Um, my team ended up winning that case challenge. It was awesome. Um, and then the third project I worked on was a business project, which was really complicated essentially i was doing a string matching algorithm for fund names like mutual funds um, and that was probably the least interesting but the most impactful thing i did essentially they had two data sets of thousands of fund names like blackrock government environmentally conscious fund one and then on the other data set it would be B R E N V conch fund i and like it was it was essentially creating an algorithm that could match up those two strings, and it just required a lot of domain knowledge of knowing, like, FND is going to be fun, um, ENV is going to be environmental. It, it went a little beyond that. Um, but yeah, when, when you're at an internship, they'll probably give you a few different projects that you're working on throughout the summer um, or beyond. Uh, Kusha had an internship at SAP, and it turned into a part-time job that he's been doing for the past year. Yeah. And yeah, we just we want to be mindful, so let's try to wrap it up. But last thing is, uh, feel free to reach out to us at any time. Like we have our names here. You can search us on like a Gmail if you want to email us. Connect with us on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, connect, connect. Yes, awesome. Um, but yeah, that pretty much wraps it up. And touch my dude. Dude, get out. I'm ending the recording. Uh, okay, can I get on that side?